The last 5,000 years has been a modern period for the species Homo sapiens. It has involved an attempt to escape the natural world and to live in high civilization. The move from nature to civilization has had profound biological consequences. On the one hand, a move towards a thoroughgoing lowering of aggression for the cooperative ventures of civilized life, and on the other hand, a curiously correspondent ramping up of violence and predatory behavior by groups peripheral to the centers of civilization, all of which has resulted in a relentless agon between civilization and periphery. And of a special significance, a succeed an era of imperialist takeovers by most prominently the violent outsiders. In Eurasia, these biophysical calm political developments have manifested themselves in a drift of power northwards. In this talk, we attempt a purely biological explanation of how this agon arose, drawing on the theoretic centrifugal speciation. And then outline the peculiar role that works of literature and a literary culture have played in the prosecution of and ju ideological justification for the takeovers. For this latter, we will focus on Gilgamesh, the Homeric epics, and the Bible. Finally, we'll say something about the idea of modernity itself. What does it mean to be modern? How would you identify a modern person? Are people taught to be modern? In particular, this matter. If modernity involves an ironic outsider's perspective, are we, with beneficence of forethought, training young people to be outsiders, as per the views of the literary critic Lionel Trilling? This talk was first given on the 15th of October 2014 and is being given today on the 29th of January 2019. How does the great engine of history literature work? Preamble one. In this talk, I'm going to make an astonishing claim. We must be in that category of species that knows about its own speciation. What does this mean? We can't have known about Darwin's or Mendel's or Mayer's ideas 100 or 200,000 years ago. That doesn't make sense. Although, we might perhaps have intuited some of Darwin's views such as that there is a struggle for survival or that some animals are better adapted or fitter than others. But those ideas are not quite what we are talking about today. What I'm asserting is that we must have had cultural memory of and known about the idea of paradise very early on in our emergence and that this has had serious consequences for how we later came to view the world and the processes governing it. The serious consequences are that paradisal or ideal states of affairs are a reality, at least in our mind's eye, and can somehow be summoned into existence in the here and now and furthermore are an initial step in the justification for the living of our everyday lives. This obviously has something to do with concept religion and the idea of there being an other world. A magical world, a world replete with perfections, Edens, Arcadias, Utopias, promised lands, lands of milk and honey. The processes that govern this world endued with religion along with its annex, the other world, are to be thought of in this way. Certain perfective ideas are able to be spirited, that must be the right word, back from up, down, across, depending on where this other world is imagined to be located, to a community, originally a band, later a tribe, and even later than that, communities of like-minded individuals, nations, races, cults, churchgoers, voters, and any group trading in conceptions of ideological purity. But why precisely is the paradise intuition a matter of speciation? Because perfectives 
are continually being hived off from and yet getting shaped by primitives. You need to cultivate perfection because messy and violent nature or primitive primal life is a continual presence threatening you nearby. And what else is there besides nature or primitive life to cultivate? Perfect gardens contain dirt and worms and talking satanic snakes. Hence the distinguishing itself from and the taming of nature must be one and the same thing. What we call culture must be this apparently single thing and the noticing of it. Preamble two. Let's begin here by going back to 1992 and the book, Where Art Comes From and Why. In that book, Ellen Disanayake argued that we are a misnamed species. We are not Homo sapiens. The zeal with which we are ruining our own planet seems a strong confirmation of this view. Her suggestion for a better description is Homo aestheticus. We are that species which betrays a consuming interest in making things special and making special things. In her claim, there is a nice ready-made accident of language for what I'm suggesting today. This is because of the word special. We have an obsession with the special. But is this only a happy accident? Let me put you in mind of the Paleolithic Classes site in South Africa at caves near the Classes River, the earliest or early members at caves near the Classes River, the earliest or early members of our species were mining. They were digging out red ochre from the cave walls. There is a mystery about what they did with the red ochre afterwards. They didn't put it on the walls as per later early artists. And this leaves open an intriguing possibility that they were putting the ochre on their bodies. So a possible early incarnation for us. A species with an interest in art, in form, in design, in color. But what if this body painting were more than arty decoration? What if this artwork was intended to mark rank? In particular, could it have been used to mark off the smart from the dumb? And rather than this being what would today be called elitism, was it rather an evolutionary necessity for a gracile branch of the hominids that has no great strength, no hard protective exoskeleton or shell, no horns, no claws, and can't exude a noxious smell or spit poison? And a species that needs to perform high order tasks such as secreting water in gourds, burying it underground to make provision for dry times in what could be a rather complicated climate. I'm dwelling on this matter of our early ancestors because a species that goes down the evolutionary smart path has a gnawing problem. And that is the problem of the unsmart. And we can get a line on this from at least one species I can think of, the capuchin monkeys of Central America. What you are told about capuchins is that they are able to use certain stones to crack open nuts. Recent close observation of these monkeys, however, has revealed something very interesting. Only some of the monkeys ever master the correct rock selection and correct smashing technique. Some are able to do it poorly, but some never master it at all. Presumably these latter resort to a life of theft or begging or some manner of wheedling. In any case, if the capuchins wish to go further down the smart path and say, rise to the dizzying heights of our species, then internal selection needs to take place and on the basis of personal skill. When the capuchins following this line of thought come to have their own Jesus of Nazareth, that well-known king of spiritual gifts, he will say to them, to he who has, more will be given. So that via the parables of the kingdom of the monkey god, they will be on their way to paradise. So that much by way of preamble on the notion that the great engine involves ideality. Now let's go to our talk proper and begin with some hard science.
Part one, theoretic one, speciation. The person who invented the word speciation, Orator Cook, an American, hadn't been born when Darwin published Origin of Species. So, on the whole, what we're talking about here is quite a recent debate. It is during the 20th century that the word starts to be used and that the hard questions concerning speciation start to be asked. A turning point comes for the discussion of this question when the German-American Ernst Mayer proposes in the early 1940s that speciation is born of purely geographic or geophysical circumstance. Namely, that at a certain point in time, conspecifics become separated by an impenetrable barrier, a sea, a river, a mountain range, a rift valley, a forest or jungle, and that over an extended period, the two groups start to adapt differently in their two different environments. A test, and unfortunately a test that is exceedingly difficult to carry out, is to establish whether any members of the now different groups can breed successfully with one another. If they can't, you have a new species. Mayer's outlook on speciation was born in part of a dissatisfaction with the prevailing Darwinian view that species must be created by minor and successive adaptive changes, the so-called gradualist view, and of an outright hostility to genetic explanations complaining bitterly about Richard Dawkins' views right into his old age, and he lived to be 101. The problem with Darwin's gradualism was that this could not be proven from the available fossil record. So that was a major issue all by itself. But there was an even bigger and more basic problem. Species can stay the same and for thousands or even millions of years, like for instance crocodiles. The solution to this was proposed as early as the beginning of the 1970s by Eldredge and the notorious Stephen Jay Gould. Species will stay the same in a settled geophysical locale, but when changes occur to the environmental conditions, the species adapts rapidly and hence the theory of punctuated equilibria. Not really fitting in with these broad outlines of 20th century developments in thinking about speciation, however, is another important position. And that is the view that within a species, a gradation of characters can be observed across a wide landscape. Enter someone of major interest for us, William Brown and the idea of centers of speciation, radiated characters and centrifugal speciation. Part two, theoretic two, centrifugal speciation. In 1957, William Brown published an article entitled simply centrifugal speciation. Up until Brown's time, writers on biology and population systematics had noted without any great interest that at the same time that an identifiable species of animals, birds, plants are existing or persisting, they are attended in peripheral areas by versions of themselves with primitive characters. The thinking in these earlier writers was that species arise to be as they are for rather vague Darwinian reasons or for reasons that were simply just not known. And by way of a further curiosity, there are also these outlier primitives. Full stop. Brown took the not altogether shocking step of insinuating that it was time to move on from this purely descriptive and draw no conclusions biology and say that the species plus the primitives constitute trumpet sound, speciation itself. The proposed mechanism for Brown was this. A group of conspecifics emerges and comes to dominate an area that is favorable and hospitable, not bothering with a surrounding area that is less than favorable, less than hospitable. Perfect paradisal conditions. This is a theoretical stage one for speciation. In a stage two, the species moves out from its favorable conditions homeland for one of two reasons. The first is overpopulation. 
The success of the species in its home territory is so great that further territory is required for its increased numbers. The second is some sort of disastrous geophysical change in the home territory, such as drought, earthquake, fire, etc. So the first of the reasons is a spill out of the home territory scenario. The second is a forced decamping scenario. Whatever the cause, the result is that the species moves out, edges out, wanders out from an ideal world to a world of straightened circumstances. Circumstances where there arises a requirement for austere adaptations. Stage three sees a return to normal situation whereby either the overpopulation ends or the homeland becomes attractive again, the drought passes, etc. And next step, there is a movement to go back home. This, however, leaves technical terminology, refugial pockets. to subsist at the periphery. The return home stage three period must of necessity give rise to a reconfiguration of the species with an inflection of a certain amount of primitive characters. Then in a projection of stages stage four up to stage N, there is a concertinering taking place. Over long periods. An alternation of centrifugal and centripetal movements creating the radiation of characters that Brown outlines in his article. It may not be helpful to give examples here because you have to be an expert on a species to be able to identify any of its primitive characters. It could be a feature that's present or one that's absent. It could be a colour or the lack of a colour, e.g. the colour of a bird's breast or wingtip, or it could be an adaptation for living in a cold or hot climate, etc. I'm however a bit reluctant to give no examples, so here are a couple from the article. The American meadow frog of the eastern USA. The dominant central species of this frog has an external vocal sac. The peripherals are without it. The European barn owl, the owl of Middle Europe up to Scandinavia, is generally a dark bird with dark spots on its breast plumages. The barn owls of Russia and Eastern Europe down to the Mediterranean, along to Spain, then across up to Western France and the British Isles, have white or sparsely spotted breast plumage. Understand here to be a lack of interest in signalling by appearance. Further examples of centrifugal speciation are given in the book A Theory of Human and Primate Evolution 18, 1989 by our very own Colin Groves at this university. In that book he is rather reviving Brown's theoretic after a considerable period of neglect. And he has again put us in mind of this idea with a talk in January 2014 on the very exciting Demonici skeletons, the oldest hominid fossils ever to be found outside of Africa. These rather odd undersized skeletons, mainly skulls found in Georgia, Central Western Asia, mostly in the 1990s, dating to 1.7 million years, have puzzled paleoanthropologists. So here we are up in Georgia. This is Demonici. Here's Africa. But the verdict now, as per the article by Spoor in Nature, October 2013, is that these are peripheral primitives for a period where we can actually form a reasonable picture of the evolution of hominids. So, there is a central homeland of a more regular variety of hominids in the eastern African, East African Rift Valley. 
here 1.7 million years ago. But you have at the same time the peculiar Swat Kranz man down here, down in the south of Africa, and the undersized and generally unusual Demonisi cases. These are your outlier primitives. Even more recently than that, but also in 2014, we have the two, they have the TV documentary on the Red Deer Cave people, people in inverted commas, of 11,500 years ago in the Yunnan province of China. Who or what are these? We can't call them a simple example of centrifugal speciation because they are not, of course, a radiation from the basin of China. But uh, they seem to be rather a hybrid of Homo erectus, which yes, have radiated out from Africa with the mysterious northern Denisovan entity. And they have come to settle in the high southern area of China. That can be as it may. There are how, they are, however, a good example of a refugial pocket and of the fact that a hominid can survive for a very long time until something happens. Like for instance, that they crash into or are crashed into by a more advanced species. The fact that this group disappears around 11,000 years ago is very suggestive of the idea that they did in fact run into an advanced species, Neolithic man. Part three, theoretic three, Neolithic religion and culture. The origins of religion is a murky topic. I've given my views on this in earlier talks, but today I'm going to pursue a different emphasis. I'm going to suggest that religion is the expression of a desire for permanence. The etymology of the word is most likely religio, so a rebinding. And the governing idea is presumably restatements of the law, or slightly more abstractly, a rebinding of the community. For this aspect of religion, something like this happens. The people assemble in a fixed spot. A designated special member of the group, think a priest, reads out a list of things approved, then a list of things disapproved. So a list of blessings and curses. The audience responds, Amen. This is accompanied by a minimum of cultic activity, then everybody goes home. That's a basic model for what early formal religion looked like. But what we need to do is think ourselves back to a time even before that happened. A time before any legal regularity. Perhaps this occurred. Some theoretical first person would say, X has just died. He was a great man in our group. Although he has passed over into the other world, his body has been left behind to us. We will bury it in a prominent or special place probably a central location where everyone can see it or get to it and make it even more prominent by raising up dirt over it. At a later stage, someone says permanence for that person is fine, but what about permanence for us as a community? Let's mark an area in the landscape that's special for us and which co-houses the great person's remains. When this stage is reached, you have arrived at a pre-formalities religio where the community experiences itself permanently attached to the power of the special dead person and permanently attached to the powers and magical qualities of the other world. All these ideas of permanence have created a new world order for Homo sapiens. They are not just creatures in the landscape. They are distinct. They have the priority of group identity. They are special, and they have friends in high places. All this sets the stage for what we know in outline to have happened in the Neolithic period, 10,000 to 3,000 BC. In this period, where you have dense populations, like the Fertile Crescent, i.e. the Middle East, there is an emergence of things called cities. These, quote, cities are walled enclosures for communities, or maybe just elites which double as centers for cult, and where you have a low population 
And remember, the Neolithic is still a decidedly low population world. Europe in 4000 BC has one person for every 20 square kilometers. There are more modest versions. There are more modest versions of the same thing. Circular designs in the landscape, circular enclosures, Middle Europe 49 to 4700, and tumuli, barrows, stone circles, so-called hill forts, and burrs. Just on this question of world populations, very low populations all the way through till we get to about 3000 BC and then skyrockets. You'll notice that these are older figures here in the top line and these are sort of very authoritative figures down here uh, from 2007, a Dutch study. You'll notice that the figures are substantially similar with the exception of here. In this uh, Neolithic period, late Neolithic period, uh, articles have been written on the fact that these numbers here need to be bumped up. But leaving that aside, these numbers have remained remarkably the same, remarkably similar, and the takeoff doesn't come till civilization. A final moment for the Neolithic comes with the advent of warfare which according to me has to be placed rather firmly at the very end of the Neolithic and into the high civilization period. So the end of the fourth millennium, beginning of the third. Just based on hard evidence, we could go for 3,400 in Egypt, 2,500 in Mesopotamia, but only very slowly making its way out to peripheral world areas. The so-called hill forts, for instance, for most of their life, were most definitely not fortified. You might want to check the Time Team episode on Kairi outside the present day city of Cardiff in southern Wales, where the local expert on the Iron Age has to assure the show's presenter, an exceedingly puzzled Tony Robinson, that he doesn't expect to find a single spearhead or any weapon on what they suspect before the archaeological dig gets underway to be a major Iron Age site, i.e. first millennium BC. In the course of the show, they do find the whole area to be a rather astonishing major hill fort in continuous Iron Age use with occupation even as early as 800 BC. But as predicted, not a single weapon. But to return to our point, the quotes cities and the circular enclosures become, with the advent of warfare, defensive points for civilization, for its achievements, for its treasures, for its attempts at paradise. And no matter how securely a group and their enclosed sanctified areas are established, they become military targets for neighbors. And it is to this period of warfare under high civilization that we must now turn our attention. Part four, how does history work? With our three theoretics in place, plus a few ideas from my earlier talks, we can now explain how all history works. Four millennia, we were a species living on this planet with just a few arty and religious ideas. Then along came the Neolithic Revolution, probably as a result of a receding ice age. And our rather close observation of the natural world allowed us to stumble on the idea of farming and the domestication of animals. And then something else happened, or next to nothing happened, as per chaos theory. A butterfly flapped its wings, and all of a sudden, the population started to increase, especially in the Fertile Crescent. But later on, butterflies flapped their wings in the China Basin and in Central America. All these areas being, in the terms of chaos theory, spaces of the possible. And since they were spaces of the possible, the possibility of high civilization occurred. High civilization became a punctuation for an equilibrium the equilibrium of a species living happily and quietly in the landscape with a bit of art, a bit of religion, a bit of an economy, and a bit of trade between distant isolated groups. 
a species with no special reason to want to lord it over one another. Insofar as the punctuation obtains, those happy, question mark, simpler times are over. Now there is metallurgy, weapons, standing army, specialist specializations, capital, big architecture and luxury items. And the concomitant of such things covetousness. This new direction for evolution sets in train a type of centrifugal speciation. The civilized centers are always moving out into their peripheral areas, always looking for resources. This in turn triggers a primitive periphery into action to stop them making off with their resources. And by using primitive tactics, at which by definition they are very good, they are able, at least occasionally, to invade the central area. After a while, a new equilibrium is reached. And then, next step, a group just a bit further out becomes drawn into the process. First, these civilizations arise, Egypt and Summa. Egypt remains a rather static civilization for a long time because of various geophysical barriers a western and eastern desert. The mountains of the deep south, the lake-like expansions of the White Niles inundations, and the Mediterranean and Red Seas. Suma is not so lucky. It is exposed to all Eurasia. It is taken over by the Akkadians from the north and later their Arkasite, Amorite and Hittite invaders. Eventually the Assyrians come from the upper Tigris take over virtually and take over all virtually all Mesopotamia. Later still, coming from outside of Mesopotamia are the Medes and Persians and then finally for antiquity come the very peripheral Greeks and Romans. Later than all that, Northern Europeans come to establish a succession of quotes, world empires. So there you have it. That's how world history works. The punctuation, however, it should be noted, hasn't quite played itself out and may not do so for some time to come, given our propensity for war. Part five, how does literature work? For all of our time as Homo sapiens, we have plotted against poor old nature exploiting her and, if I may say so, killing our way to the top. With, however, the period of high civilization, this has become turbocharged. Our plotting, our rapacity has been raised up exponentially. But as a sort of super predator on planet Earth, we've learnt an ironic lesson. It's the ironic lesson about irony. We, as I put it at the beginning of this talk, know about our own speciation. I'm going to call this the irony of the paradox of success, or maybe the irony of limitations. All this is to say that the centrifugal speciation of the last 5,000 years is merely a magnification of what happened earlier in our history, but which is now careering dangerously out of control. The texts which we will be looking at here, Gilgamesh, the Iliad, Odyssey and the Bible, are nicely emblematic of us learning our ironic lesson after furiously asserting our superiority. These texts should all, roughly speaking, have a two-part structure. Part one, the furious assertion of superiority. Part two, the ironic lesson or ironic consequence. A feature of this format involves a curious back to frontism whereby the assertions of superiority are retrojected back in time to ensure that our evolutionary opposition, the opponents of my subtitle, don't get the better of us. Us being the latter day civilizers at the end of history or the listeners to or readers of the texts. So what we are looking for is this. Structure one. 
Here is the latter-day success of the overcomers of an earlier high civilization or dominant power. It features the raw power of heroes and exactly how it was that they took over from the original powers. Here is the realization that raw power or whatever magical methods were employed by your ancestors won't work or aren't available in your own high civilization. You need the older evolutionary skills, the irony of underplayed responses, measured approaches and deception. And on top of this, there is the ironic fallout from being so righteous, so successful, so powerful. It's the self-damage wrought by success. Samuel Beckett says, plus on est grand, plus on est vide. Shakespeare says, unhappy lies the head that wears the crown. And popular tradition says, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The fundamentality of this structure and its decisive importance in allowing a people to push back their importance in time, that is to a time before they became actually historically important, gives way, however, to a second structure. This one, structure two. As the ethnic group or nation becomes ever more successful, there is a need for more irony, and in fact, there is a complete explosion of it. This results in that murky category naught up here becoming filled with mythic elaborations and a hodgepodge of etiological material which tells of the foretime and gives clues as to how the ethnic group got to be so superior. Now, there's a great danger in talking about these literary structures in such an abstract fashion. So let's make sure people are following what's being asserted here by taking a break from the ancient world and giving a contemporary example of epic art formation. The Star Wars series. I think this can help us out with how structures one and two work. Here's a list of the Star Wars movies in chronological order. I'm just going to run through them quickly. Star Wars, then two more. The Phantom Menace, and then two more. The Clone Wars. Episode 7, The Force Awakens. Rogue One, A Star Wars Story. The Last Jedi, Solo, a Star Wars story, and one scheduled for this year, number 12. Here we are starting our epic in the middle, in the approved fashion, or perhaps we should say for clarity that we are starting with what is to become the middle. So one, the Star Wars movie. Then two movies that have events that come later, end of structure one. Then in the fullness of time, 1999 actually, 22 years after the first movie, comes the first prequel, The Phantom Menace, and we are launched spectacularly into structure two. We go back to a period well before the first movie and which was only dimly described in that movie. Then come again movies set in a in a later time, but which are still prequels. Then, with what we might call the full structure in place, middle after before, middle after before, come elaborations that can really turn up in any fictional terrain and around the basic structure. Step one here is the seventh movie, The Clone Wars, 2008, a prequel which covers a 30-year period between movies five and six. 
But this disruption to the structure engenders what we might call an ex existential crisis. The next movie, movie number eight, has a very odd title. Episode seven. Oops. Episode seven, The Force Awakens. The title signals a return of the franchise and a return to sequels, but it also signals something else. We are to have an aporia with regard to the Clone Wars. The structure has now become more important than any individual movie. If the Clone Wars can just be considered an artwork refusé, there can be a return to the imagined to be aesthetically perfect systemic rollout of trilogies. So trilogy one was the first three, Trilogy 2 was 4, 5, and 6. And with movie 8 comes the announcement from the makers or franchise owners that this is the first in another trilogy. So now... So now, three lots of three. Why the obsession with threes? Greek culture. Greek law, three plaintiffs to bring a case, or three witnesses to get a conviction. So in the Greek mind, social truth is established by three instances. In rhetoric, three examples are given to illustrate a point. And this idea has had a long afterlife with traditional sayings, third time proves it, three times a charm. But notice another detail for this new status of, for Star Wars, this, Roman numerals, another archaizing move, another claim to the authority of the past, all of which is to raise what are merely popular movies with a cult following to high art and to a quasi-religious status. So, it's onwards and upwards to canonical status for the Star Wars cycle. But notice, final twist and a very significant departure, already prefigured by movie number seven, The Clone Wars, more romantic oddity. Further complications to the emerging canon. The two prequels, Rogue One and Solo, nine and 11, to be located here. Before, in the, before the period of Star Wars. And therefore, the absolute denial by the romantic sideshows to be refused by the classical structure. So all that I'm hoping will help us with our analysis of ancient epic. First, Gilgamesh. In Gilgamesh, the structure one format is pretty easy to see. The whole story up to the killing of Humbaba is a series of triumphs for civilization. There is not much interest in victories for the periphery, and this requires a little bit of explanation. In the third millennium BC and the beginning of the second, high civilization is up and running, but can fall apart quite quickly and not be replaced by anything in particular. In Egypt in this period, for instance, there are two capital K kingdoms but they fall apart without being replaced by anything comparable. To just mention a small point here, the Hyksos, who are involved with the collapse of the Middle Kingdom, don't, in the period following the collapse, ever really rule much more of Egypt than the Eastern Nile Delta. So in the collapse period, you have nothing more than aspiration to civilization. So, a text about this period like Gilgamesh is much more concerned with how civilization can be maintained and is only dimly interested in the invasion of it. But back to the series of triumphs. The triumphs for civilization are Gilgamesh coming to power in the very first sentence, the solution to his droit de seigneur arrogance is successfully thought up and executed when an 
equally energetic, wild and youthful companion Enkidu is found for him. Not only is the creation of the wild man out in the country a success, but so also is the plan to calm him down, calm the wild man down, with the character called the harlot. Then another success. Enkidu is brought to Uruk to challenge Gilgamesh directly and everything is going swimmingly when Gilgamesh manages to just better Enkidu in what we'll call a winning draw in their showdown fight and they become best buddies. We are not apparently allowed to ask the skeptical question of why this didn't result in the good burgers of Uruk having twice as much trouble as they had before. Apparently in this particular particular parable of civilization versus periphery, the central power can be reconciled with the outsider by knocking some sense into him. But as an extension of this parable logic comes the next step. The reconciled buddies working together go off in pursuit of glory at the periphery in order to kill the tree monster Humbaba. All this presumably indicates that civilization and periphery are never quite happily reconciled. Some of the periphery can be co-opted, but not all. As a final success and great victory for civilization, Humbaba is killed. End of part one for structure one. Then the beginning of the traumatic and ironic part two. Enkidu has to die for his role in the murder of Humbaba. Gilgamesh is devastated because he realizes apparently for the first time that he, being only two-thirds god, is also going to die. In a completely new phase in the story, Gilgamesh goes to the end of the world for salvation and any clues as to how immortality can be attained. This new phase has nothing really to do with the struggle between center and periphery, except much more metaphorically, the struggle between mortality and divinity or something of that sort and is the oldest story of a hero that goes to the faraway place. It needs to be pointed out here that the person that he is going to meet, Utanapishtim, in the Akkadian version of the epic, has a name that directly expresses the idea of the faraway. He's Mr. The Faraway. When Gilgamesh gets to his exotic destination, he learns from Utanapishtim the story of the flood, a sort of first hiving off of the God blessed from the God cursed. The cursed, you might like to note, are not here the unrighteous of the Noah story of later tradition, but, and get this, are people who talked too much. All their talk was so loud, they were keeping the gods up at night. This whole episode stands as a sort of allegory of civilization. The humble hero has to go out on a journey to a locus of perfect understandings, a locus where other heroes have gone before him and where in some sense they have an abode. In other words, we are a species that is not coterminous with the civilizations we create. Civilization means going away on a journey. It's an ironic locus, it's an abstraction. Now, the Iliad Odyssey. Largely the same thing happens here, only much more stark. The Iliad is a long grinding tale about the periphery having the power to really take on civilization, figured by the Achaeans, taking on the Trojans, and reading outside the text the power to invade and destroy it. But destroying the thing that impresses you and of which you are envious is of course a high grade and sort of Macbethic irony. Then in the Odyssey, there is straight away a complete departure from the high order civilization periphery tensions to a, of a 10 year siege to the problem that an outsider would have faced at an earlier time than the Troy war era. Having to deal with a whole parade of older civilizations, ambiguously paradisal islands and giant monsters, including some archaic monsters amongst the dead, the warrior comrades, who didn't survive into this new era. Very significantly, Achilles and Agamemnon. The Odyssey, it should be especially noted, is a real handbook on irony, a gamut of ironic situations, 
defeating monsters with puns, not wanting to live permanently with a goddess on a paradisal island, reducing yourself to a beggar in your own house, etc. In short, a handbook on how to understand and use irony in a world chock full of enemies. Further to this, the Odyssey contains an ironic reminder that whoever you are, you are a plaything of fate and might have to reconcile yourself with the diminished status of an ordinary man. The swineherd Eumaeus, born the son of a king of an island, is a study in this type of ironic derogation. The Bible. The great victory, the great evolutionary success in the Bible is the invasion of Canaan. Although there is a complication, which is that there is a second great evolutionary success, the fabricated dual monarchy of Judah and Israel, where Judahites and Benjaminites are claiming to be up at the level of the historical power of Israel. But let's just stick to the invasion of Canaan. Here the text is saying, we were outsiders, but we deserve to be the insiders. We took over because we deserve to live in and be preeminent in the land of milk and honey. Everything before this is heavily fictional, etiological setup material. So you have to explain how you got to be in a position to be suitable invaders of Canaan, or even more basically, how you got to be on the borders of Canaan ready to invade. And therefore, you come from Egypt in that famous story to establish that you have a connection to high civilization. Compare in this regard Abraham set out from Ur of the Chaldees. Now, irony. This set up ideological material is peppered with ironies. Easily the most shocking of these is that our great forefathers committed all sorts of sins, including three of the really big ones, worshipping other gods, marrying foreign women and adopting a foreign cult practices. After the invasion, there is a pronounced preoccupation with irony. I'm just going to give a quick list of some of these. Job is often given as the epicentral moment for biblical irony. There is the profound irony that the world's most righteous man is a foreigner. Instead of a Jew, a man from Uz, maybe down south of Judea in northern or western Arabia. Other ironies follow, that the righteous man should suffer punishment from God. That God is involved with Satan for the carrying out of experiments and betting on human behavior. In Jonah, a suitable and pious person is chosen by God for the vocation of prophet in Nineveh. His response is to effectively say, oh, no thanks, I'm off on holiday. The irony here is that you are not supposed to say no to God, especially if chosen for some high task. Jeremiah in the sewer in chapter 38 is a favorite ironic episode from the Old Testament. You are not supposed to put a holy man anywhere near excrement. What happens after is sustained irony. The Ethiopian eunuch Ebed Melek is the only person to make a complaint about Jeremiah's treatment. Someone who is not a Jew and is not even a man. This is followed by King Zedekiah's confession to Jeremiah that if he, King Zedekiah, falls into the hands of the besieging Babylonians and Chaldeans, he's got no concerns about treatment by them, but that he's terrified of what the Jews who have deserted to them will do to him. This is the irony of the enemy within, which is very biblical. Now, the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. This book, you'll notice, is hard to read. This has to do with a problem connected to the locution, thus says the Lord of hosts. This is the characteristic way a priest announces that he is speaking in God's voice and broadcasting an oracle. To go on the evidence of this particular text, there is a problem connected with the overuse of this locution. But there's a bigger problem, and it occurs when the oracular pronouncement is a curse on priests who are the vehicles of God's broadcasts, the users of the locution. In other words, we've reached a degree zero for irony. 
And if I may say so, are getting a bit of an insight into why canonical Old Testament texts ceased to be written. Taking this irony any further would have led to Bedlam, a world where each priest is his own fatwa edict issuer. Let me finish off this section on biblical irony by reading out loud this one little treasure, Proverbs 30, 24 to 28. Four things on earth are small, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they provide their food in the summer. The badgers are a people not mighty, yet they make their homes in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet all of them march in rank. The lizard you can take in your hands, yet it is in king's palaces. This is the irony of the transfer of power. And it's rather easy to see how Christianity picks up on this with its ironical theme that the weak can be strong and the insignificant can be important. Part six, the modernity problem. In the 17th century, a Dutch professor made the announcement that we are now living in the modern world. This was a fateful pronouncement because just about every literate person since has bought it. And it's now a commonplace of the academy that the modern world began then. Two examples, however, of rather notable people on whom this view seems to have made little impression. First, Matthew Arnold. Arnold thought that the Greeks were modern. This was because they had a conception of the ideal. This comes out very clearly in their visual art. They want to see ideal forms. But also it's in their philosophy with Plato and his take on ideal forms. And for Arnold, the Elizabethans were not modern with a decided lack of interest in the smooth perfections of art preferring the enthusiastic social turbulence of Shakespeare and other stage writers. Secondly, we have Denis Diderot. Diderot, with what we can safely describe as a deep encyclopedic knowledge, understood the modern to be a rather specific phenomenon in connection with art performance and the critical observance of it by sober members of the public. That is, if we were to take his text, Rameau's Nephew, as a guide to his views. The modern, for him, is an ebullient, risk-taking performance being tracked by an audience both enthralled and skeptical. Here, notice, you don't have to live in any particular era. You just need an exuberant, but also measured, art, engineering, architectural, lifestyle, venture, to be put on display and examined critically by a sane person. Understanding this idea of the modern has consequences for any real understanding of our forebears, because this process has been going on, according to me, since some theoretical first Homo sapiens shook his hips in a dance or put on some red ochre. Look at me conquering the physical world and departing from dull nature. Or uttered this sentence, I think that this circle that I've just drawn on the ground with a stick is a perfect form that exists not only here in front of us, but elsewhere in a world of perfect shapes. And his interlocutor saying in reply, you are an intriguing weirdo. Now let's go and look for dinner. So modern is the departure of people and things from dull and rough nature. The point I want to make here is that we are a species that is evolving according to a very fixed principle. An energy for art is being continually qualified and reined in by a skeptical outsider worldview that smart and civilized might not have been the greatest idea we've ever come up with. In short, the difficult outsider primitive version of ourselves may not be helping us with the basic project of civilization, but it might serve the purpose of constraining us and keeping us in touch with reality. And that the, 
This is an integral part of the civilization project itself. QED, how centrifugal speciation is operative in our modern species. 120,000 years ago to now. What began as plots against nature have turned determinedly into plots against each other. Our dominant evolutionary project is continuously being shaped by successive waves of plotting primitive outsiders. But now in an era where there are only plotting primitive outsiders. Another way of putting this is that during the first 115,000 years, there wasn't much for the project to do. The last 5,000 years, however, has seen a massive ratcheting up of this outsider as insider process. But to keep the peace with the Dutch professor, we'll say that there has been a further ramping up of this process in the last four centuries. And for people who have read the flyer for this talk, Lionel Trilling was right. We are teaching young people to be critics and outsiders in so far as we are able. C. Trilling's take on the difficulties of teaching a rather conservative student populace modern literature. In his thought bubble on this, they would, if they had the wit to do so, and they don't, shout at him, why don't you just leave us alone? We are not modern man. We don't experience the world as a field for updating and revolutionizing. We just want degrees and jobs and houses in the suburbs. We are not part of the risk-taking, ironizing, revolutionizing project of modernity. Conclusion. In this talk, I've tried to show that we are a species which knows about its own speciation and intervenes in it. It intervenes in it because it is able to, with art, with irony, and with abstracting from reality, which are all basically the same thing. Our artistic plots for the domination of nature initially, and then for a long time, had no earth-shattering consequences. The last 5,000 years, however, have been a different matter altogether. In a new punctuating era, a rising population has generated a two impulse dynamic. A centrally located and evolutionally advanced group plot centrifugally against wild nature, but in a much more concerted way than any time previous. And wild peripherals organize in response to plot centripetally against them. The escalation of ironic plotting in this new era makes for a dangerous and confrontational world. Our earliest epics and then dramatic works generally are testimonies to the escalation. They usher in a new great game of civilization, which is to invade the opponent's circular precincts in the landscape before they get to yours. These circular precincts, which were originally designed to have a largely religious and domestic function, now become fortified militarily. But such texts with their poisonous ironic invasions come conjoined with their ironic antidote. An ironic humility is required to live in this new era of a world that is reeling out of control. And such texts carry a message that is relevant for us today. You can't affect a solution to our growing problem of ironies without participating in them. That's the desperate and daunting task of a modern mind. Thanks.